Hello everyone. Today we're going to unravel the aggregate expenditure model which was developed by a British economist named John Maynard Keynes some 70 or 80 years ago and it was Keynes's attempt to try to develop one model to describe the workings of a national economy. He was doing this in order to try to unravel the mysteries, the causes and the solutions of the Great Depression that plagued the global economy in the 1930s. So, we're going to take a look at some of his underlying assumptions. One of his underlying assumptions was that GDP equals C plus I plus G plus NX. Uh, he put this a little differently than we just did, but I've expressed it in this way because it is uh, an identity that we've studied over the past couple of weeks, and it's also an identity that's true. The way that Keynes would have said it is that planned spending, or what he called aggregate expenditures, was always equal to the sum of planned consumption, which we called C, planned investment, which we call I, government spending, and net exports. Keynes assumed that consumption, government spending, and net exports always occurred, but the strength of I was relatively uncontrollable. It was a, a very much a variable and it did not always occur, could not always assume to be, to be occurring. Sometimes when firms went in, Keynes reasoned, to examine their inventories in their warehouses, they found that their inventories had built up unexpectedly, so that the sales that had occurred in the economy wasn't strong enough to have... Um, to have allow them to sell all of the merchandise that they had planned to sell. But sometimes the firms, when they did these checks, went in to look and inspect their warehouses and they found that, that uh, the inventories had been unexpectedly depleted so that sales were had been stronger than firms had anticipated. The results of these investigations that firms do on a quarterly basis or on a yearly basis provide a signal for the firms about what to do in the upcoming quarters. So if sales were unexpectedly strong, that would send a signal to firms to increase output and hire more people. If sales were unexpectedly weak, inventories had built up, that would send a signal to firms to cut back on production and start to lay people off. The model itself that Keynes developed, based on some of these assumptions, looks like, a, looks like this. On the vertical axis, we have what Keynes called aggregate expenditures or aggregate or total spending. On the horizontal axis, we have real GDP, something that we've been focusing on in our class for the last couple of weeks. What Keynes then did is he drew a line, a 45 degree line, which would represent an equilibrium between aggregate expenditures, total spending, and real GDP. At every point along this line, spending done by consumers and firms and governments and people living abroad would be exactly equal to the output of a nation. That would be, I guess, an ideal situation. What Keynes found, though, is when he started to investigate consumption and investment and government spending and net exports, the result of that was less than ideal. And for the nations that he was investigating, the United States and Britain, when he added up these variables, it produced a line, shallow slope line, like the one that is illustrated in this particular model. A couple more things before we get into the subtle nuances of this model. First of all, Keynes and we will be holding the price level constant in this model. The second thing that we need to be aware of is that this model does not in, uh, assume a full level of employment. And we'll talk about employment and unemployment a little bit later in subsequent models, but Keynes's model really couldn't make a whole lot of insight, shed a whole lot of insight into current levels of employment. So, what do these two lines mean?
The most important aspect of this simple Keynesian model that we've illustrated is this idea of a Keynesian equilibrium, which would occur when our aggregate expenditure curve, which is this shallow line here, the C plus I plus G plus an X, crosses our 45 degree mark. This would tell us that at this particular point that I am outlining here with my cursor, spending is exactly equal to output, and our economy then would be in equilibrium. What would happen at different levels? We'll use this to illustrate a point and hopefully shed some further light on the mechanics and the workings of this model. At levels of output less than equilibrium, <coughs> what would happen is that our spending here would be greater than our actual level of output. So what would happen in the real economy if this were the case and if we were operating at Y1 in our national economy is that our, uh, our inventories among firms would be, build, or would be being depleted at a faster than anticipated rate. We're spending here as a nation much more than we're producing. <coughs> we're probably borrowing money to do this, we're probably uh, charging on our credit cards in order to do this, and government is probably borrowing in order to do its spending. Firms are seeing a great amount of economic activity, and the signals being sent to those firms is to bump up production and to increase employment. At output levels greater than equilibrium, such as the one demonstrated here at Y2, our planned spending is less than our total output. And so what happens here at this particular point is that firms are seeing their warehouses build up unexpectedly so that they're, they're not selling nearly as much as they had anticipated. So the signal then sent to firms because their warehouses have been building up at an unexpectedly fast rate, is to slow down on production, decrease output, and to probably either decrease or restrict worker hours or to lay people off. If we're going to then take a closer look at these areas of disequilibrium, I'm going to focus on this level of output of Y1, keeping in mind that at level Y, our economy is in equilibrium because that is where our aggregate expenditure curve crosses this 45 uh, degree line where aggregate expenditures would equal actual output. At Y1, remember from the previous slide, we said that planned spending is here at 0A, this particular level. But our firms had assumed and had produced for a level of spending at zero B, which is here. And that meant, means that we have a state of disequilibrium at this gap that I'm identifying with my cursor. More is being produced than is demanded. Uh, zero B, the output level of, a, of the nation, is greater than zero A. And that means that firms are experiencing a buildup of their inventories. More output is unsold and it sits unsold in, in warehouses, and the signal being sent to firms is to produce less cutting worker hours or laying workers off. What, if this happens, it means that real GDP will actually fall in future, and we, our national economy will move from level Y1 back to Y and back to equilibrium. Now, see if you can tell me what then would occur at Y2. Pause the, you should pause the video, and I'm going to pause the video a little bit to give you some thought, a time to think about it. Okay, without looking back, did you get it? Hopefully you did. This means that the nation is spending more than it's actually producing, and we have this area that we would call dis-savings here. Uh, the firms uh, are receiving signals that their inventories are being depleted at a very fast rate, and so they're trying to then bump up employment 
uh, they're trying to increase their output, and the economy would move from Y2 back to an equilibrium uh, at, at level Y. So that's a, an overview of the Keynesian aggregate expenditure model. You may be having some additional questions. I would imagine that you would. And one big question may be, can the average aggregate expenditure curve actually shift? The answer is yes, but before we get to that, we really need to examine some marginal behaviors that also happen with the next economy. So in our next video, we're going to discuss some concepts called average propensity to consume, average propensity to save, marginal propensity to consume, and marginal propensity to save, and then we'll be able to really properly address this particular big question about the shifting that could occur in the aggregate expenditure curve. See you then.